today will be Slavisha Tasic. Uh, he has most recently worked as an associate professor of economics at the University of Mary in Bismarck, North Dakota, uh, but has recently moved to Sarajevo where he works, lives, and teaches economics now. Uh, he has also taught economics in Russia, Ukraine, and Lithuania, and has worked as a consultant in many international organizations as well as government organizations. Uh, he also published many articles in international academic journals and has authored a book on the world financial crisis. And most recently, he has written a book on capitalism. It's actually called What is Capitalism? And that is his topic for today. So enjoy the lecture. Thank you. I wrote a book that is called uh, What is Capitalism? Most recently in Serbia, Shai Capitalism. And uh, uh, it was supposed to be here though. It was supposed to be here before the book fair but, uh, and then for this event, but it's not yet. And uh, I was thinking uh, that the first speaker, Mr. Mitchell, was saying uh, that uh, voting is the, the worst thing in the world. Voting is the, 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 the worst thing <laughs> of all evils. And then uh, Matt Kibbe said that the podiums are the worst of all evils. And then I concluded, Book editors are the worst of all evils. You know, they are conspiring against me to delay the publication of my book that was supposed to cause the revolution, and uh, they successfully delayed it. So, but we are waiting, and, and it should be there at some point, hopefully within a month or so. Uh, what is capitalism, and, and, and what are we uh, uh, talking about here today? Uh, I know it's a basic question, and everybody's supposed to, to, to know it, sort of. Uh, but I figure that it's not exactly that. So let's start first with this, with some history. With a, this is the, the graph. This is my favorite graph probably in, in, in the entire world. And it shows the entire history of, of economics, or rather of, of economy, history economy in, in the world. Look what's here. This is GDP per capita, gross domestic product, or income per capita, the living standard, the, 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 the most common measure of living standard per capita, per person in the world. And these are different countries in different colors, just a few selected countries. And this is timeline here, you see the year. I started from year zero, we could start from way back. We could start from the beginnings of civilizations, uh, the Greeks, the Egyptians, Mesopotamians. We could start from the, from the, from the times when people started living in, in, in communities, from, from 10, uh, around 10,000 years before uh, Christ. So we can start from that time, and uh, we'll still get this zero here. You see how this line is stuck to zero, up until quite recently. So that was the economic history of the world. Nothing happened, nothing happened forever. For thousands and thousands of years, there was no noticeable increase in living standard whatsoever. Zero, that means, the, first, the, the, the life of the average person didn't change at all in the economic sense. You go back to the times of old Greeks and Romans, and then you see these amphitheaters, and, and, and you see the gladiators and stuff, but you see how the average person lives. They live, they're very poor, they live very short lives, uh, they work a lot, and they, 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 they live very uncertain lives. They don't know what's happening tomorrow. You fast forward, 2,000 years, you go to 1700, the 17th and 18th century, and what do you see? Economically, you see the exact same thing. Nothing changed there. So you see a different architecture. Now we have cathedrals in Europe. You see different political structures. Now, by that time, they already developed parliaments. They developed uh, uh, what are today's ministries and, and prime ministers and stuff. But economically, exactly nothing happened. It's about the same level of living standard. For thousands of years, the old Greeks and the contempt, not to co never, but 17, 1800, uh, French or Italian or Germans or anywhere else in the world, live exactly the same, about the same level of living standard. I find that pretty fascinating. And uh, when I, I think I assumed, before I knew this stuff, so when, uh, b before I inquired about the economic history of the world, I assume, I guess, that the, the, the development is rather linear, that economies grow like this. You know how they grow today? They grow at 2%, 3%. If you're in Serbia, then it's 6%. No, it's not. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they grow. We expect some growth rate. We expect some GDP growth rate. We are used to some 
a decent uh, growth rate, GDP growth rate, income growth rate. And I think we assumed, or I assumed in the past, that that was like that forever. That's how, that's how it worked. That's how life works. No, not at all, actually. It was stagnant for a very, very long time, and then suddenly it increased like that. It increased to these crazy levels. It increased within, in history, in a very short time span. Historically, this is a very short time. This is about 200 years. It starts in the early 1800s. That's when the sustainable GDP growth per capita starts. That's a very, historically, a very short time. And increased, you see the line. Incredible. It's incredible. It's immeasurable. This is GDP per capita now. And that's a very rudimentary measure. That's a very rough measure of, of, of income. There are a bunch of things that we can't measure. A bunch of things that, that enter our quality of life that are not even measurable. So this line is probably even underestimating the level of, of wealth and comfort that we have today. I'll give you one example. Anesthesia. If you go to a dentist and they need to take your tooth out, they give you this uh, 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 medicine, this anesthesia, and you know it doesn't hurt. If you ever went, you know that it doesn't hurt. That thing costs very little today. I don't, know, I don't know how much it costs, but say it costs ten bucks. That means that it contributes to GDP about ten dollars or euros. But the comfort, the level of comfort that you get from that is a lot more. If you had to, you would pay even more just to have that thing. We're lucky it's so cheap. So these are immeasurable things. And when you look at that, our growth, the GDP growth that happened in the past 200 years is literally incredibly high. Literally immense, immeasurable. That's what happened. That's what happened. Now, why did, it, why did that happen? If you, if, if, you, if you, once you start thinking about it, then you have to ask, well, why did it happen? First of all, why did it happen? Where did it happen? It happened, it started in, in, in the, in the uh, very west of Europe, in a, in a very small, first of all, Western Europe, if you ever looked at the globe, know the map, maps are misleading, but globes are realistic. If you look at the globe, Western Europe is a very small patch of the, of the planet, very small, tiny. And you look where the economic growth happened, where it started. It started in, in, in Holland and, uh, and, and England, UK today. That's where it started, very small part of the world. It started there. Why did it start there? Why in Western Europe? Very quickly it spread to the rest of the, of, of the, of the Western Europe and then to, to, to European offshoots such as the United States today and, and, and Australia, uh, the Anglo-Saxon world, and then the rest of the world. But why did it start in the West? If you Again, if you time travel and then you went to this uh, early 1800s or late 1700s, and if you were supposed to guess where, where will economic growth happen and which area of the world will be the most advanced within 100 years or 200 years from now, you probably wouldn't have guessed that that would be Western Europe. You probably wouldn't think so. How do I know? We know that from history, not from records. People who traveled to China back then, even before that, Marco Polo diaries, and later in history, people who traveled to China that time, they're amazed, they're saying, look at this progress, look what I have. Marco Polo is writing, look at these thousands of bridges, we will never have that, it's amazing. Like, this thing is amazing. The Chinese emperor in the late 1800s, so after, after Adam Smith wrote his books, after things are already developing in England, writes to the, to the, to the uh, uh, British uh, king, uh, British king asking to, to trade, to open for trade and to have some sort of trade agreement. The Chinese emperor writes back, says, well, you know, you're rather underdeveloped place of the world. You're in the end of the world. We are the, we are the center of the world. We are called the middle kingdom, as they call themselves, because the center of the world. We are developed. I understand that you want to learn from us, that, that, that you want to, to get our stuff, which is, uh, you know, luxurious silk and all this great stuff. But we don't really have interest in trading with you because, you know, you're a backwater, let's face it. Uh, there's nothing going on there. And uh, uh, that was the prevailing opinion of the time. China was more developed. It looked, at, at, at least it looked, more developed. We know that when, when Columbus went, being a Western European, being Italian, Spanish, when he, when he went 
to, to the United States. And you have these three, three, three vessels, right? Uh, Chinese admiral, the certain uh, Zheng He, about 100 years before Columbus, had 200 vessels that were up to five times bigger than Columbus's ships. Five times bigger. He went from China all over the, 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 the Pacific, uh, the, the Indian Ocean around India, all the way to Africa. He went there, he looked around, he said, well, there's nothing to see. We are the most developed place on Earth. Uh, let's go home. And therein lies this difference. When they went home, when he went home, the Chinese emperor told the admiral, all right, great job, but really we don't have anything to learn from the rest of the world. You know, we are good, we are the best already. So let's not do this anymore. Let's not travel, let's not discover anymore. There's no need to trade. There's no need to, to, to open up for anything. The Chinese emperor literally closed down the dynasty, not just one emperor, closed down the country and said, we are not gonna do this anymore. For the next 300 years, they did not travel around really. They did not inquire, nothing happened. In the meantime, and after them even, when Columbus, how did Columbus, why did Columbus uh, 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 sail under the Spanish flag? Well, he tried to find money, he tried to find funds in, 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 in Italy, he's from Genoa. He tried around, he asked around the Spanish queen would give him this money. What is the difference there? Could anybody prohibit Columbus from, from, from sailing, from going, you know, from trying to, to his wrong idea to, to, to try to find India towards the West? Could anybody stop him? Nobody could stop him in Europe. That is the main difference. The mere fact that nobody could stop him, there was no emperor, there was no authority, there was no central authority that could stop him. In China, there was. China was technologically more advanced, better ships, had the funding, had all that, but also had a central authority that could stop all private inquiry and initiative. In Europe, you didn't have that. That is the beginning of our answer, why Europe started growing. You see the red line, UK, and then uh, France, and then only later Eastern Europe and China. That is, that is the reason why Western Europe started growing first. That was just about the only place on earth with no central authority. Nobody was in charge of anything. You had what, you'd, what, 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 what today would resemble anarchy. You had what today we would call private cities. When Titus has his presentation, these private cities are a lot like medieval cities back then. A lot like that. And nobody was in charge. No central authority. There were all kinds of, Europe was all in conflicts. Every little territory had their own ruler. They, were, they, they would fight each other, or they were at least in some sort of potential conflict. They had a vertical hierarchy and vertical conflicts between, the, between the, 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 the aristocracy and then the higher level, the kings. Right, Magna Carta and everything, they were, they were, they were always in a real conflict. Again, a conflict, nobody was in charge, even with one, within one territory, Nobody was really in charge. They would fight. That's how they created the system of rules that doesn't allow anybody in particular to be in charge and to do things arbitrarily. Kings were emasculated pretty early in European history. Later on, they made a sort of comeback after Reformation and they had this era of absolutism. But before that, they really had no power, no absolute power in Europe going on either territorially or vertically within, it, within any given territory. Why is that important? Well, from there, you have the development of the rule of law. If you don't have absolute power, if you don't surrender to the will of the single authority, then you have to set up some rules. You have to behave according to some predetermined rules. And that's what started happening. We call it today the rule of law. Some rules that are the same for everybody. Rules such as private property. The rule that what is private property? Private, private property, private ownership is a rule that nobody can take your stuff, right? We saw it here. Nobody can take your stuff. That's the rule that existed elsewhere. Fine, China knew about it, everybody knew about it. Greeks, Romans, everybody knew about it. But in Europe, it was really enforced. It was really enforced because nobody had authority. I had a, I had a, uh, I'm pulling up my phone because I, I 
forgot to put it on the slide, I remember later, the, the quote from William Pitt, uh, uh, the, the elder, my favorite quote of all politicians ever. So this uh, uh, guy is saying this, he's giving a speech to the parliament, the prime minister of, of, of England is saying this, the poorest man may in his cottage be defiant to all the forces of the crown. It may be frail, the cottage. Its roof may shake. The wind may blow through it. The storm may enter, the rain may enter, but the king of England cannot enter. All his force dares not cross the threshold of the ruined tenement. The king of England cannot enter. That is the rule of private property. That's what it means, not the Savamala thing. <laughs> where they do enter easily. <laughs> now I'm into be political here, but that is a, that's where development starts, the security of private property. That's why it existed in Europe. Not because Europe had a grand strategy, somebody wrote up a strategy in, in about 1700s, let's develop this place. Nothing like that ever happened. Simply there was a conflict of authorities, the consequence of which the unwanted the unintended consequence of that was that people were free to follow their plans. People were secure and free to follow their plans. Nobody predicted that. Nobody predicted economic growth to come out of that. And in short, that is, that is why growth first starts there in the West. A couple of more things. i would look at the time here. A couple of more things. This would be institutions that develop. That's why when I say that the, 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 the rule of law, the rule of law, uh, uh, private property rights, those are the institutions that develop there. They're not the only thing that matters. What matters is also, well, ideas, values. Briefly about these values. What are these values? You know, when you, you think about, when you talk about business here, and when you say that, you know, well, there, here's a company, and what are they trying to do? They're trying to, to make some profit. That's what they're doing. You know, we, look, we still look down to that. One big change that happened just around there in Europe, and uh, we don't quite know today for what reason, but one big change that happened was that people started changing their minds about it. They started valuing entrepreneurs and businesses. Throughout history, people looked down on the poor entrepreneurs. They looked at them as second-rate citizens. All these wise uh, Greek philosophers, all, the, all of them, would say things such as, well, you know, he's just a trader. That's something that not really, you know, who were the heroes in medieval times? These aristocrats, these knights that fight with them. That, those are the heroes, traders, merchants, they were second class citizens, you know, in, the, in terms of, 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 of social status. That started changing. People like Voltaire start writing. He starts thinking and writing, wait a second. What is this uh, powder gentleman, this aristocrat, what is he contributing to society? You know, he's sitting around there and being lazy and owning half of the country. And what exactly is his contribution? But what about this merchant? The merchant actually creates prosperity. And these attitudes start changing. Those are the values. Compare that again, put it in touch with what is happening today. I think values are changing here. But we need to understand that that's a crucial component as well to appreciate the entrepreneurs, to understand that they create value, they create prosperity. They are the creators. These little guys, they translate already in rent and, and, and all that, you know, she contributed to, to, to that a lot, how entrepreneurs do something. They, they create prosperity for all of us. So the change, when, it, when we, I think there is a lot of talk around here in this country of the, you know, changing the system of values, changing the value system. How about this? This value, you know, looking at entrepreneurs as somebody that creates businesses, companies, somebody that creates prosperity. And mind you, they don't do it for uh, reasons of charity. They don't do it because they want to be nice to you. They don't. They do it because they're self-interested. But that's exactly what capitalism is about. And Adam Smith, when, who first observed that this was going on, he was a little prescient. He observed first. 1776, he says, why, why do they, what happens here, he says, these entrepreneurs, these businesses, they follow their own self-interest, yes, they work for profit, but this is the secret of invisible hand, the invisible hand means that these private profits translate into public benefits, we benefit from the fact that somebody else wants to make money, 
how do you how do you make money in capitalism? How do you profit? By serving others, by serving the needs of others, by meeting the needs of others. That's the only way. That or throwing capitalism. But in real free market system, this is the only way. All right. Let's go back to the main question. So what is this thing? What is capitalism? What is capitalism? We can say now if 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 we see you know the the, the, the trajectory of growth here, we can say well capital is something that we start talking about around uh, 1800s, and that's when that's when this capitalism thing started. I kind of disagree with that. I think capitalism existed all along. It's just that within capitalism, some of these things changed. Values and institutions got better. Values changed. Ideas sprang up ideas, entrepreneurial ideas and all that. We can get back to that a little bit later. Uh, I think capitalism always existed. And if you want to define it, I, uh, you know, when you start writing a book called What is Capitalism? The first thing you do, well, you Google, what is capitalism? You know, let me try to find out, I need some help here. So I get Google and I find a bunch of these definitions from different encyclopedias, Webster Dictionary, Britannica, Wikipedia, and they would say something like this. This is a, a combination of, of what they're saying. An economic system based on private ownership where people and businesses compete and characterized by capital accumulation. All of that is wrong. And people are like, none of it, literally almost none of that is true. How come now, what is it? Capitalism, first of all, is not a system. It's not a system. A system is an organized scheme that somebody created. That's a system. Cap Nobody invented capitalism. Nobody created capitalism. Alan Smith didn't say, oh, here, I'm going to define capitalism here. Socialism was invented. Socialism was a scheme. Right? It was literally invented by a bunch of people, including Marx and Engels, not only them. Uh, and they invented This is what we, we want to do. This is the plan. This is the blueprint, the agenda. That's socialism. It's an invention, right? It's a plan. Capitalism just happens. That just exists. It's what people do when they are left alone. It's not a system. Don't call it a system. Libertarians make the mistake. They would say things such as, well, you know, capital is not perfect, but that's the best system invented yet. No. It's not a system. It's not invented. Right? We don't know of any better system. No. Capitalism simply means leave people alone and see what happens. See, see what they do. That's what it is. It always existed. Phoenicians traded 3,000 years ago. Greeks, Romans, whoever. Everybody in history always traded. Prisoners trade in jail. They come up with their own currency. Cigarettes, you name it. Always, it's always there. Capitalism is always there in, in, in some way. You can't even suppress it. Capitalism exists even within socialism because there are black markets. You can't really root it out. It's not a system. It's an occurrence. It's something that just happens. So none of that. Is this a system? We call this a system. This is a skating rink. Is, this, is that a system? What's, what do skaters do? Everybody, all of them, they follow their own path. They go wherever they want to go. They have different abilities, different plans. Nobody coordinates them. And that's that uh, ring, it looks, it looks really well when you look at it. It works really well. People fall, people get up. But nobody runs it, nobody designs it, they just put up the ring. But nobody tells people where to go, nobody tells them, all right, everybody to the left, everybody to... Nobody does, no plan, no command there. And it's going on, everybody's doing their own thing, their own plan. And yet they create order. They look incredibly orderly there. This is what our friend F.A. Hayek called spontaneous order. They spontaneously create this order. That's, that's how capitalism is. The skating ring is a metaphor for, for capitalism. I stole that from Dan Klein, one great economist. Dan Klein, he, he, had a, he, he, he uh, came up with this metaphor. Yeah. Markets are like a skating ring. Individuals following their own plan and creating this order. But it's not a system. You see what it is. People doing things without coordination, creating actual order. The next, the next thing was that businesses are, remember this definition, that where people and businesses compete, 
what's about this competition? You know, competition and capitalism. And again, liberty, including libertarians, everyone will tell you, well, competition is the best thing, and uh, you know, that's how markets work and all that. There's very little competition. Competition is one aspect of the markets. That's not a main aspect. Are they competing right now? This is your typical market transaction. We do it nearly every day. Do these two compete? They're not competing, they're cooperating. That's what they're doing. He might be competing with other coffee shops, but that's one aspect. Mostly they're cooperating. Every trade is voluntary, every exchange is voluntary, every exchange means that there are two satisfied sides, and they both benefit. It's cooperation. Every business cooperates with their customers, with their suppliers, with just about everybody else except for people from the same branch, which is a small part of the full picture. You know how they point to this Darwinian competition and then they say, well, you capitalists, you libertarians, you're like social Darwinists. And look, even Darwin didn't mean, didn't, didn't, uh, didn't think of, 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 uh, of survival and evolution in a competitive way. After Darwin, there was a, what today we would call a hack. Uh, Julian uh, Huxley, Darwin's book, who, who wrote, a, wrote an essay saying, Competition, look, Darwin's survival struggle also can be applied to society. We struggle for survival. He wrote that essay saying it's the Darwinian competition in society. To that, so Huxley became a eugenicist. Later on, he saw society like that, as people competing for space. And he thought that was capitalism. There was a Russian anarchist called Peter Kropotkin who criticized Huxley, who wrote a book called Mutual Aid. Kropotkin didn't sit in the office. Kropotkin actually went to Siberia. He was a prince, an amazing guy. He was a prince who gave up all that, who gave up all that. He was arrested by the Tsarist government after that. He went to Siberia to actually research what animals and species do. How do they actually behave? And he figured out they mostly cooperate within the same species. Yes, you can have an alpha male with the monkeys, but they, even they still cooperate within the group. It's 95% cooperation. Species within each species, they first of all cooperate. Formlessly, they cooperate. Even among species, there are remarkable cases of cooperation. They cannot exist without each other. There's very little competition. There is, he says, in nature, it's mostly cooperation. Kropotkin went on to become an anarchist, unfortunately, kind of a left-wing anarchist. But he, he saw this right. He saw that societies, people, mostly cooperate. They don't really compete the way that these uh, mistaken Darwinists thought. So he said his reading of Darwin was more proper. His reading of Darwin was, was actually truer to Darwin himself. So that's it. It's not about competition. Competition exists in capitalism. Do not define it as a system where everybody competes. We don't. We mostly cooperate when we, when we transact with each other. And then the very name, you know, the last thing there was the accumulation of capital. The accumulation of capital is what defines. Is capitalism about capital? First, the name capitalism was invented by, by Marx. It was invented by a guy before Marx, but really Marx was the one who, who promoted the name. And called it capitalism. Why is that? Well, because Marx thought it was all about capital. Look, it's not all about capital. What are the interest rates today? You know, now Piketty wrote a book thinking it's all about capital. Interest rates today are zero, or just about zero. Risk plus risk free interest rates are zero or negative. That means that the reward for capital is zero. That means the price of capital is zero. If the price of something is zero, we call that thing worthless. There's no value, as the value of zero. Capital is nearly worthless in the world today. You can find capital if you want to start a business. You can find capital. What you need is an idea, the critical factor there is an idea. That is the scarce item here, not capital. Yes, capital matters in capitalism. I mean, you need some money to start something, but it's far from the crucial component. Not even close, not even close. Here's one graph, sorry about these lines of graph, I can't resist, but um, so economically capital is not that, simply not that valuable. Socially too, let's see, the blue line 
is the share of wages in top 1%. You know how they uh, start with this to top 1%, the, the, the super rich and all that. Here's the share. How do, how do top 1% make money? Are they capitalists that, that sit on money? You know, before, in medieval times, all your money you made by sitting on it, aristocracy. You're the king or you're the uh, baron, you sit on that and you know, you're wealthy. Now it's very different. The income share of the richest people, of everybody, but including even 1%, including even the richest, their income share, uh, uh, the, the wages, increase as the dominant, or, or, or the, the, the share of wages increases as a dominant factor of wealth here. To put this in words simply, there are less and less rich uh, Harris and Harris's, less and less uh, Athenas, Onassis, and Paris Hiltons, and more and more Novak Djokovic or, or Beyonce's, or people who make a lot of money with their own labor. That's what's happening in the world. That's what's been happening in a hundred years, in the last hundred years. Here's the same graph showing that. Oh, if, uh, or, or a different graph showing the same thing. Top 1% income component of dividends. So this is the, 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 the share of capital income is dwindling. <coughs> what matters is what you do more and more. Exactly the opposite of the story that we hear. So capital doesn't really matter as a factor of production. It's not crucial. And it's not even crucial anymore as a factor of wealth in a social sense it's not. So why do we call it capitalism? I have no idea. I call it capitalism, the title of my book, because that's accepted title. So, I mean, what am I going to say? What is the free market? It just, we don't have a better, we don't, we don't have a good term. So I accepted it. But uh, I go on and on there, saying, it's the whole thing, that, you know, associated with capital. Capital is really pretty relevant in capitalism. Didier McCloskey calls it uh, innovationism. It's more about idea, how to innovate, what to invent, how to do things. All right. So what is capitalism? Well, that's what people do when they're left alone. And when you have the right set of institutions and values, people create wealth. Let me ask you this, to put it here, to closer to the ground. What is, what is capitalism today? I don't know, when you look out the window, how do we observe capitalism? today in Serbia. Which column here smacks more of, of, of capitalism? You know, what associates you more of capitalism? You know, I think we are told mostly capitalism about its reform, about its uh, uh, design plan to reform. So about, this is how I see examples of capitalism in Serbia. What is the time here? How, uh, we have 10 minutes left. Including, including questions. questions. Real quickly, real quick here. The examples of capitalism I see here, I, IT sector, I think everybody figured that out by now, even the government. So they even figured out that the IT sector developed incredibly without anybody's plan, without anybody seeing that the IT sector in Serbia and in the region is amazing, is doing an amazing job. Nobody saw it coming. Totally unplanned, private initiative, just like that, it happened. But how about private healthcare? The government healthcare system has been decaying and decaying and just getting worse. They keep funding it, they keep dropping money on it, but it's just not working very well. It, you know, parts work here and there. But the private health system here and in the region, again, it's, some of the, it's one of the most amazing things I've seen in the, in the past 20 years. You have these clinics, individual doctors, compared to the, to the world, that's very rare. It's completely <coughs> unregulated here, I mean, or it's mostly unregulated here. You cannot do anything like that in Western Europe or the United States. Start a clinic just like that, or start your own doctor's office. Trust me, you cannot do that in the United States even, or most of Europe. Details later, but it's so heavily regulated that it's very, very difficult to do that stuff. Here you can. It's kind of <coughs> escaped the eye of the government, you can. And this system is amazing, the private health system, Still not, not everybody can afford it, but it's getting cheaper, it's getting better. There is the whole thing of medical tourism going on. MRI, the, the, the magnet resonance, MRI, uh, here costs, <coughs> in the United States, costs, the average cost of MRI is, uh, is $3,000. Here, 
$100. It's internationally competitive. Again, the unregulated system that escaped the Iowa government, it grew just like that. And it's an amazing thing. When we talk about capitalism in Serbia, when you get into an argument next time in the bar, point to those things. That's capitalism in Serbia. Not the <coughs> FBI, not when you take the property from somebody and then you give it to a big foreign company that also bribes the government. That's not capitalism. That's cronism. It's capitalism. When nobody is watching, there is the growing IT sector, there is the thriving healthcare sector. That's capitalism. That's what happens from below. That's what happens with the private initiative. Thank you.